I'm wondering because you're now teaching at、um, Peabody, is、mm-hmm. it in the pre college division? Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how you find out about this job because for like orchestra musicians, they like there's like a website where you can just like find all、right. the jobs there. Is there a website、mm-hmm. for teaching jobs? Um, I think there is a directory, or I think a site where they do list it. In my case, though, how a lot of the teaching things happen was I am Suzuki trained. So, if you guys are familiar with the Suzuki method, the you can get trained to become a Suzuki teacher. So, one of my grad classes courses, I guess electives, was like Suzuki pedagogy. So by taking that class, by the time that I would graduate from that class, I would be a registered Suzuki teacher or like a certified Suzuki teacher. By Wait, was that a Juilliard class? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was an option. There were a lot of other classes that were interesting that I would have taken in place of the Suzuki. But going into grad school, I already was with the mindset that I only had two years to figure out. How am I going to make money by the time I graduated? So I was trying to like strategically figure out where, if I take Suzuki and get a certification by the time I graduate, then I can apply to Suzuki jobs. As opposed to if I took another elective that was cool, but would that in the long run provide me with a work opportunity? So one of the reasons that I Actually, ended up coming back to Juilliard for grad school was because of that Suzuki offering that they had. Once I got the, I guess, the certification, then you're listed in like a Suzuki teaching directory. You also have like access to like the Suzuki network of teachers and jobs. And the school that I got trained at would send us job openings like in emails in bulk. It'd be like, okay, these are like the openings around the country, you know. If you want, and so for me, Peabody was just one of the things in the list that was within a commutable radius from New York. So out of grad school, I literally applied to like every commutable job, you know, around New York, and that's why I teach at a school in Connecticut. I also teach in New York, but I also teach in Baltimore. The reason why I'm kind of so scattered. Is because I was just applying to everything and just like accepting every job that I would get to all of those places that I applied. So that's kind of that was my journey of finding teaching jobs. Aside from that, like literally cold turkey emailing schools is like another thing that I did. I would like look up Suzuki schools in Manhattan or New York. I would just figure out every school, figure out their email. Send them a bunch of emails to every school and be like, "Hey, so I'm looking for a job. Like, do you have any openings?" Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, was my way of doing things, and it was the same thing with Peabody. It was just kind of a job opening on an email. Sent them an email. Sent them, you know, like the applications, the resume. Then I would go, and they would do the whole. There were there's usually multiple steps in a teaching job application process. So of course the initial is like the either cover cover letter resume just kind of who are who are you kind of situation and then after that usually there's some kind of a teaching demonstration involved so you would go to the site and they would have like a guinea pig student that you would teach in front of like the other faculty or like the executive director or other people and show them. How you teach,、um, and sometimes it might be like a group class that you might also teach, and then after that you would have an in-person interview or I guess video interview with the panel or the team faculty, and then then you know you start moving onwards from that process. Did you teach before you did your masters? In in a sense of like private teaching, yes, I I definitely had a few students. I started teaching from. Around high school, and then I had just you know it wasn't like anything intense. It would be like a couple students maybe here and there. So I had I had some, except in my, I was experiencing that when 
prior to me getting the training and when I was teaching, especially beginners, I was noticing how lost I was when like a four-year-old or like five-year-old is right across from you and they have no idea how to play the cello. I noticed how, I guess, powerless I was, you know, because in my mind, of course, I know how to play the cello and in my mind, it makes sense how things work. But of course, to communicate that to another human being in a way that they would understand, and especially to a little creature, um, like a three, four, five-year-old, that's a different art. That's a different skill set that you have, to, you have to learn. So that's one of the also other reasons and catalysts that pushed me to get trained because I was having experiences where I was feeling that I was really inadequate as a teacher, especially when it was a beginner. And that's kind of one of the catalysts that pushed me to actually get trained so I wouldn't ruin these kids' lives. You know, I, was, I was kind of getting you know, a little afraid and scared that I was ruining potentials because I didn't know what I was doing. So, you know, things like that. But yeah, I was definitely teaching before, but not very well. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the things that I also recently have figured out is that sometimes I have to think like them and I would just pick up the violin as if I don't know how to hold it and then like I'd like try different ways and like try to do weird bow hands that they do. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that happens. Yeah. <laughs> when students come and they like already learn for a few years. I think something that like has been interesting for me to try to try to become a beginner again was hold my instrument backwards and try to play the same thing that they were yeah. playing except I was holding the instrument backwards. You end up sounding terrible. You sound like a beginner and like everything is tense and like the coordination is really awkward. But that's one of the good methods to just kind of at least get a sense of what they're going through and how you would, you know, troubleshoot the issues that you are going through trying to play everything backwards. How do you try to stay patient? <laughs> yeah. See, for me, because I'm teaching a couple kids now, I just, it's very hard for me to get, because I'll be like, oh my god, why can't you do this? And then just, like, I, of course I didn't say that, but like inside of my head, I literally like, like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the problem, I guess, with impatience comes from when you are expecting something from another person but you're not receiving what you are expecting right it's generally when a lot of that frustration comes because you are projecting you know what should be easy or what sh they should be able to do at any given time and then they're not doing that for you so i think that's when you're usually getting very much frustrated which I completely understand. Whenever you're in that situation, one way to help tackle that is changing your own mentality of not perceiving it so much as this person is not doing what I want them to do. I guess as a teacher, you constantly want to be curious and try to find different perspectives of why something is happening. And that makes it much more interesting sitting across from them. Say, you know, you ask them to do something and they didn't or like and or they tried and it like failed miserably and like it was already like 10th time that they tried it and it's still not working at that point you know i think that's where it gets fun as a teacher because you can really tap into your own creativity it's how many different ways can i explain the same concept you know can i tell this one simple concept in 10 different ways you know or trying to get into the psychology of that kid's thought process, trying to figure out, I wonder why he is reacting a certain way. Because we often just make assumptions, right? If a student just kind of comes in and say that they're not improved from the previous week, and you're like, wow, this kid didn't practice, you know, bad student. And that's an assumption that we make. But maybe during the course of their week, maybe there were trouble at home. You know, maybe things were giving them a really hard time outside of cello that has reflected in their cello playing. Or maybe the way that you are presenting the material as a teacher is maybe not that interesting or not that engaging. So they are not as fascinated 
So when they go home, they're not really enchanted to want to practice, you know, because often I'm sure, you know, some of the best teachers that you guys have come across in your life, after your lesson, you want to go practice because you're like, wow, this, this was amazing. Let me like try to figure this out. And then you have the other lessons where right after you're really disenchanted and you're like, wow, this, I suck and this is really terrible. And like my teacher really thinks poorly of me. And like, then the reason why you go to the practice room starts to be from fear, right? You're doing it out of obligation and fear because if you don't, you get in trouble. And when you repeat that process, then, you know, the reason why you would play an instrument now starts to come from a place of a really unhealthy, I guess, fuel source. And then it's going to start reflecting in your lessons. And then it becomes a deadly cycle. So whenever I try to always keep in mind that whenever something's not going well, I try to figure, I first blame myself, you know, because if I am presenting something in a way that resonates with that kid, then, you know, any child will get excited over anything, really. I know during this pandemic, a lot of people are opting out to do online lessons. What is your opinion on it? Would you recommend that for anyone? Mm -hmm. So I have a slightly different experience with video, I guess, lessons growing up, or I guess in my own training, I studied with a teacher named Richard Aaron, and he was based in Michigan. So he would fly into New York every weekend to teach lessons, which was ridiculous. But often because of that, we would have a lot of video lessons whether maybe he couldn't fly in or he had schedule conflicts or things, anything of the nature or any makeup lesson, extra lessons were all video. So I grew up kind of a lot of my training on the video, at least my college and my graduate uh, degrees. So I guess I was more used to how I worked and I was maybe more accepting to that format. That being said, of course, there's a lot of difficult things about it, namely, you know, sound quality or the not the inability to be hands on. So if they're struggling with a bow hold, you can't actually go and like help them hold it. You know, you have to you have to find ways to explain it verbally and by like showing which is significantly harder when you can't actually do that for them. Even same thing with just like setting up the instrument and just making sure that everything's in its right place is much harder when you can't. That being said, though, it is definitely possible. I think the key to making a successful virtual lesson, especially if it's a beginner or a younger student, is for the parent to be involved. It's a triangle relationship, which is a big concept, I guess, at least in the Suzuki method where the teacher, parent, and the student is a very much, I guess, a really important balance where as much as you are teaching the student, you are teaching the parent because you as a teacher see that student, maybe what, like 30 minutes a week or one hour a week. And all of the other hours of the week is the parent. So if the parent doesn't know what's going on, then the chances are a lot of the hours during the course of the week are either wasted or they might be practicing wrong things of that nature. When it's a older student and more advanced student, I think the tricky thing starts to become, of course, like the nuances, you know, when it starts to get to a higher level of playing where you're dealing with a lot of the tone, the nuances of your tone, the colors, or the dynamics. Unfortunately, with a lot of these devices, you can turn them off, but a lot of them come with like a compression feature where you compress audio so everything's the same dynamic. So even if you're trying to play pianist more, if you're playing fortissimo, everything comes out the same volume. Of course, there are settings that you can do to take it off, but that does definitely make it harder to, I think, teach a higher level of students. But otherwise, you know, like intonation, you can still hear, you know, like the rhythm, the timing, you know, you can still hear. And a lot of the musicality, I think you can also capture, I think, on video. So as long as their video quality, I guess their internet connection is smooth and it's not like chopping every other like second, then I definitely think it's a great way to teach. And I think you can get the same value lesson oftentimes, whether if it's video or in person. Sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but one of the things that I love doing, it's like, 
um, when it's a little child, I would teach them something, and then I would bring the parent in and be like, okay, show show him, like, show the mom, like, or the dad, like, what we learned. Mm-hmm. And then, so then I know that this child actually did understand something instead of just faking right. it till they made it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the benefit is at least, you know, like, on Zoom or a lot of video platforms, you can record the lessons. So, I, like, I often get them to record the lessons so they can watch it back in their own time during the week just mm-hmm. to make sure that, you know, if they forgot anything or the parent can watch it later mm-hmm. to make sure that they know what's going on too is definitely a helpful feature to always just record a lesson in some capacity. Even if it's like an in-person lesson, I always think it's a great idea to even do like a voice memo of the lesson because then you often forget a lot of the little details once you leave that lesson space. Most of the time, maybe because like you're just really distracted or maybe you're just traumatized or maybe the lesson was so bad your mind was in a different place who knows there's a lot of details that's lost in from the lesson space to outside the door in my own experience as a student so i i definitely recommend a lot of recording in mm-hmm. either video or audio capacity oh sorry and then the second second question are you are you a scary teacher or like are you like the cool teacher like what are you let me guess what do you think I you think, are i think you are the cool one the chill one right i feel like he's the he's like the with the teacher who's like really like happy and like really cool about everything but then like at one point you just like snap and you just become like this like asian guy like who's really <laughs> angry yeah and then with like a rice spoon thing and then just being like, why didn't you practice? <laughs> yeah, I think by by default, I am the kind of like the friendly, bubbly, kind of like kind teacher, I guess, persona most of the time. Um, mo- that does stem from a place where I'm a, I'm a people pleaser kind of personality. I, I like to please people or I don't like to offend anyone or I don't like it when anybody gets upset at me for any reason. It like affects me like on a deep emotional level so like that because of that I generally when I especially when I first started teaching I was just trying to become like best friends with all my students was kind of how I was approaching the early stages of my teaching career but then I you know realized later on that that's not my role you know my role as a teacher is not to be your best friend you know of course I'm there to be friendly and I'm there to be your mentor and your supporter but I'm not there to be the easy one to just kind of like hang out with and, you know, not get anything done. So now I've definitely tried to find a balance of that kind of making sure that the status of you as a teacher, somebody who is of a, from a higher level than the student is an instructor kind of thing. I do try to establish and, you know, we have fun in the lesson, but if, things start to get out of hand, then I definitely kind of like click back and just become very firm and stern just to like make sure that they understand that, you know, that's not acceptable behavior kind of situation. But it's still very much a learning process for me. Um, I'm still trying to find my way to becoming a teacher. I have to choose only to do one thing between HM and GEMS and a teaching job. Which one will you choose? I personally would do JHM over teaching because JHM revolves around what makes me happy, you know, what gives me joy in life. And of course, teaching has that kind of fulfilling quality of you really, when you help someone develop and you're really there, I think there's a really great sense of reward and fulfillment, but the sense of joy that I get from JHM surpasses the amount of joy that I get from teaching, at least currently in my stage, at this stage in my life. It's a balance though, because if when I do one thing too much, then definitely I crave the other. But you know, right now, I guess I'm teaching too much and not doing as enough JHM. So maybe that's why I'm gravitating and wishing for more JHM in my life. But you know, it'd be great if JHM does become kind of a substantial career route where I can use that as I guess my main source of income would be kind of like the goal down the road. <laughs> Any <laughs> other questions? So thank you Kim for joining us today. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. For all the audience, please subscribe, like, and comment down below. 
and let us know if you have any questions or if you have any questions for Can. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, bye guys. Bye. bye. <laughs>